postpone the deadline for homework one, uh, which I'm hoping I can release today after today's lecture. Okay. So that being said, let's get started. So quick recap of where we stopped uh, uh, last week. We talked about foreign keys. And before that, we talked about the concept of keys, uh, which is related with a super key. Then you know, once you have a key, you have a uh, primary key and candidate key. Then if those keys are used in another table, uh, they become a foreign key in that second table. Okay? So that's a quick recap of what we discussed. The way you define or uh, let the system know that uh, one attribute or set of attributes uh, in the foreign key in a table is to use the keyword references. So here I'll give you a simple example. Suppose you are uh, defining the schema for the enroll table. Uh, you would do the create table statement as we have seen before. Uh, create table enroll with the schema of the table uh, followed by the primary key of that enroll table. Okay? And in addition to that, you want to specify SIV, for example, is a foreign key uh, references back to the student table. Uh, what's missing here, by the way, is that you know, since I only showed two tables here, that's why I only show the foreign key SID. But if you imagine there's another table uh, that shows you the list of courses uh, where CID, course ID, is the primary key of that table, then in addition to SID, another foreign key for this enroll table will be uh, CI. Okay? So you, you can have multiple foreign keys references back to the tables. Okay? The concept, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this one is taking a step back, but could you briefly go over the super key and key constraints in the proper subset? Uh, like I, I would like to take that discussion offline because that would means I have to re rediscuss all those things all over again. Uh, yeah, so if you have doubts on those, I would be happy to discuss those offline with you. Okay. Alright. So uh, the concept of foreign keys bring up the, uh, uh, the, the definition of the concept of integrity constraints. So integrity constraints refer to conditions that must be true for any instance of the database. Uh, we have actually seen some of this in a system. Right? For example, when you define the schema for a table, right? When I say SID is a character array of 20, uh, CID is a character array of 20, grid is a character array of 2, I actually define implicitly a type constraint for each attribute. A type constraint for each attribute. Okay? So, so that's one form of integrity constraint, uh, known, known as the domain constraint. Uh, but in addition to domain constraint, you may have a variety of different types of constraints. Okay? Constraints are specified when your schema is defined, and constraints are checked whenever the instance is modified. Whenever the instance is modified. So for example, speaking of the type constraint, right? You define those type constraints while defining the scheme, right? That's clear. And you check whether those constraints have been met whenever you modify the instance of that schema. So for example, if you have a student uh, table with an age attribute that's an uh, integer, and somebody tries to insert a new student record with age value 18.5, that's a violation of that particular type constraint and will be rejected. Either that's an insertion or update, whatever. You are trying to modify the instance with an invalid data type. That's a violation of that particular type. Okay. So to give you a quick example of that, okay? So in addition to the type constraints, uh, we may have many other constraints that we'll be talking about. And once we know the concept of constraints, we, we say a legal instance of a relation is one that satisfies all specified integrity constraints. Meaning that you may have many different instances of your table, right? You know, with respect to that particular schema. But a legal instance must be an instance that satisfies all specified constraints. For example, if you, uh, going back to the age example I just mentioned, if you age the type of integer, and so far, you have a legal instance. Now you try to insert a new student record 
with age value 18.5, which is not integer, that give you a quote unquote new instance, but it's not a legal instance because it has violated that particular type of thing. Okay? The database management system should only allow legal instances. In other words, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a simple operation, but it's actually a big deal. If you think about it, if the underlying database system is not able to enforce legal instances, then the burden falls back to the developers. Does that make sense? Now, because of this, developers are free from checking those constraints at the application level code. Right? Things are pushed down to the database kernel. They are enforced over there somewhat automatically. So that at the application level code, you are no longer burdened with doing all this check all the time. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so if an illegal action is tried to, it's tried, okay. um, does the manager stop it before the database is invalidated? OK. Very good question. So, Actually, what you are saying, let me repeat the question so the class can uh, catch up with that question. The question was, suppose someone is trying to create an illegal instance. You know, let's assume that we start with a legal instance. Okay? At some point in time, somebody is trying to insert or modify a record that results in an illegal instance. Okay? That's what's going on. The question was, is what does the database management system do? Do you reject the creation of that illegal instance before it's even created, or you allow whatever that instance is to be created first, then only check afterwards? There's a the distinction of the two. Does that make sense? Right? One is kind of like more like a preventive action, preemptive action. The other one is more like a post-processing step. Okay? Both are possible. It really depends on what kind of constraint enforcement mechanism you're going to use. Uh, we will talk about this later on when we come to the concept of trigger. And trigger actually allows you, trigger is a particular uh, machinery within the database management system, allow you to specify different kind of constraints. And in the process of defining your trigger, you will actually define which particular way of enforcement you want to take. Now, that's so much discussion on the definition of integral constraint. And you may wonder, where do ICs come from? And this actually goes back to a question I had from uh, last lecture on keys. Uh, a student came back to me. If I, uh, actually, I don't have to go all the way up. Look at this student table. So he is saying, OK, so SID is the key. Login is the key. They're unique. OK? Uh, age is not a key because you have duplicate. But how come GPA is not a key? GPA values are distinct. Right? That, that was his argument, right? GPA, if you look at this particular instance, there are three values of GPA. They are all distinct. Why can I use GPA as a key? You know, the, the, the answer to that, the fundamental reason that GPA is not a key, embedded in this particular size, where do integrity constraints come from? By the way, <coughs> all the keys we talk about, they are a type of constraint, right? They are known as key constraint, right? What kind of constraint is that? Well, if some, if some attribute or some set of attributes is a key, then no two records can have duplicate values on all key fields. That's a constraint. That's a key constraint, right? So where do constraints come from, including key constraints? Why GPA cannot, why, in that particular example, why GPA cannot be a key? When you define the schema, you define what the uh, constraints are. Yeah, you define, yeah, yeah, but let me go beyond that. You as the database designer, right? But, but you define the key based on user specification, right? You do not have much freedom in terms of specifying what are the keys? You infer those keys from reading and understanding user specification in the first place. Okay, that's a critical observation, which is integrity constraints are based on the semantics of the real-world application that's being described or captured by your database relation. Your database relations are 
designed to capture or reflect the needs of some real world applications. All integrity constraints of your database come from come from that real world application needs. Okay? So that explains why GPA is not a key because, because GPA unless okay you have a university that tells you all students must have, must have distinct GPA values. If you have that semantic from your application, yes, GPA is a key. But if you don't have that, by default, GPA can be uh, duplicated. The values can, student can have, uh, can have the same GPA values. And now you can kind of go back and understand this statement better, which is you check constraints when instances are modified, but you don't infer constraints by, by looking at just one particular instance. You never infer constraints by looking at a particular instance. For example, you don't infer the, the statement that GPA is the key by looking at this particular instance. There are millions of different possible instances, legal instances, conforming to this particular schema. In order for something to be a constraint, that constraint must be true for all possible instances, rather than just with that one particular instance at hand. Okay? That's the fundamental reason why GPA cannot be a key. Okay? So that's when where I see come from. So to summarize what I said, we check a database instance to see if an instance, if a constraint has been violated, but we never infer constraints by looking at just one particular instance. Okay? <coughs> So key and a foreign key integrity constraint are the most common. Of course, we can support more general constraint checking, such as things like, oh, university, in my university, student must be at least 17 years older. Those type of general constraint checking are possible, but you, you, you need to use more advanced mechanism, such as trigger, which we'll be talking about later, to, enforce, or to define and enforce those. Okay. Now, the way you enforce constraints, uh, speaking of that, I'm going to use the referential integrity constraint as an example to kind of give you an idea how database system actually enforce such constraints. Referential integrity constraint refer to, uh, also known as the foreign key constraint. Okay? Also known as the foreign key constraint. Fundamentally, what the referential integrity constraint says is when you declare something to be a foreign key, then that value, all records in your table with respect to that foreign key attribute, the values, they better exist in the home table where the foreign key come from. Otherwise, you end up with, for example, if you have a student ID value in the enroll table, but that particular student ID value does not even exist in the student table, then you end up with kind of like a ghost record for that student ID in the enroll table, right? If I want to know what's the name of the student who have taken uh, topology 1 and 2 and got an A, you will look at the enroll table and say, oh, that's the student ID 53650, but I'm not asking the student ID, I was asking the student name. So you say, okay, that's easy enough. I go back to the student table use that student ID value, look up the name of the student. But what if that student ID value doesn't even exist in the student table, right? So this mimics the notorious problem when you use pointers. When you use pointers, what may happen? Might be pointing to a null address. Yeah, but the pointer might point to a null address, null object. Then when you try to dereference the object using the pointer, address value, you got a segmentation fault. Because the code, if you are not careful in writing your code, you code assume that the object exists in that address space, and you say student.name, but that student object is a null object. You got null pointer exception known as, also known as segmentation fault. Okay? That's a notorious bug to, to deal with. Similarly here, Integ referential integrity constraint means that you want to make sure that those cases do not happen. 
So when I reference a student object or student record from the student table using a particular student ID value, which is a foreign key, that student record better exists. Okay? Yeah? I'm wondering about the language used with the foreign key. So if you have a table that students enrolled in classes, um, can, the, is the students table like considered like the main table and then other ones are foreign relations? Or like no, no, no. Foreign there are no relations? foreign relation. Foreign key is defined. There's no concept of foreign relation, right? So foreign key is defined with respect to the current table when a attribute or a set of attributes are taken from another table when those attributes were a key in that table. So sense? SID is a foreign key, for example. CID will be another foreign key. So does it make sense that there would be foreign keys from enrolled to students and students enrolled? Can it go Say both? again. Does it make sense that there would be a foreign key from enrolled to students and then students to enrolled? Can it go both ways? No, no, no. In foreign key means that, okay, let's, let's, let's slow down a little bit, right? Foreign key means that I'm using SID actually here in the enrolled table, right. okay? It is not a key for this table, but it is a key in the student's table. When that happens, it becomes a foreign key with respect to the enrolled table. But it is not a foreign key for the student table. Student table actually, in this particular example, has no foreign key whatsoever. Yeah. All right, so, so that means that how do we enforce this referential integrity? Right. Well, for example, okay, to give you one specific example, what should be done if an enrolled tuple with a non-existent student ID is inserted? The natural response is to reject that. Right? It's kind of like you're trying to write a C++ code where you're trying to declare a pointer and an object with, with and the pointer points to a non-object. You try to use that pointer to reference that object. Then the natural response may be, let me finish this slide, I will take your question. Na the natural response will be, the first extinction is to say, okay, I want to reject it. But there, there are other possible actions you may take, and there are other possible scenarios too. For example, what should be done if a student tuple is deleted? Right? For example, in this case, I want to delete the student 53650, Smith. For example, he has transferred to another university, or he has graduated. So he's no longer in my student table. So I'm going to delete that record. Okay? So you go ahead and delete that record from the student table. What should be done to, the, to those enrolled records that reference back to that particular student? Well, there are different possible actions you may take. You can also delete all enrolled tuple that refer to it. This is kind of like whenever you deallocate your object, after, right after you deallocate the object instances, you delete all the pointers pointing to the object. Same concept. Can you follow the discussion here? Okay. Possible action, uh, possible action number one. Another possible action is to say, this might be a mistake. If you try to delete a student record, you better make sure all the pointers, quote unquote pointers, referencing that student object are being taken care of first before you delete the student record. This, if you think about it, if you enforce this, this avoids any potential non-pointer reference in your code, in some sense. Right? So this is one possible action. Yet another possible action is, I will allow that student record to be deleted. But I still want to keep around the enrolled record information for that student. You may wonder why, why you care. Well, I can give you an example. At the university, if a student has transferred, then of course I no longer care about the student credential on that student record. But I, for analytical purposes, I do want to keep track of all the courses he or she has taken while the student was in the university for analytical purposes. For example, what's the historical average grade? for a particular course, how many students were taking this class in a particular year, semester. I need to keep around all the enrolled record in order to do those analytics. Does that make sense? I probably no longer care 
what's the name of this particular student, and so on and so forth. But for aggregation and analytical purposes, I do want to keep around all the dual records. So in that case, let me finish this slide. I will take your and his questions right there. So if that's what you want to do, what you do is you delete the student record, then you set. But, but if you don't do nothing to the enroll record, you end up in a potentially disastrous situation where if somebody tries to use that student ID value in the enroll table and refer back to the student, you get a non pointer exception in some sense. Right? If you do nothing, right? So, in this case, what, we, what you do is you set the SID in the enroll table for the student record to be deleted to some default value. So that if you code run to this, you know, oh, this is the default value, meaning that, that the student record exists at one point and then was deleted, but the enroll record has been kept around for whatever reason. Okay, that default value, one possible choice for that default is, just like in your code, when you delete an object, it, for whatever reason, if you decide to keep your pointer pointing to that object around, what would you do? You set the pointer value to none. That's one possible option. You may wonder why you ever want to do that in your code, right? When I delete objects, should I also delete the pointer pointing to it? Well, there, there are the common technique people call, people call that as a pool of pointers. I don't want to keep allocating, deallocating pointers all the time in my code. Rather, I initialize a pool of pointers and I recycle them. Let them point to different objects throughout the runtime of my, my code so that I reduce the number of pointers I need to keep. Make sense? That's one example where you deallocate the object instance. The pointer is, was pointing to this object instance. You deallocate this, you set the pointer to none. Then later you reuse this same pointer object to point to a new object instance if needed. So that you don't have to creating and deleting pointer object all the time. Okay, so those are the three possible options. Now I will pause and go back to you. What was your question? Um, so all this is handled by the developer? No, these are the actions taken potentially, potential actions taken by the database management system. There are ways for you to specify which action you want the database to take. I will show you how to do that later on. So if you're using pointer, is it possible that if you remove a student and add a new one, the new student could have an older student's uh, SID? Uh, okay, so the question was if we are, okay, let me be a little bit careful in phrasing your question, right? Because I'm using, keep in mind, I'm using pointer and object as an analogy to what's happening here. But foreign key is not a pointer. Let me be clear about that. It's an analogy, but doesn't mean foreign key and the record in another table are kind of like object and the pointers. It's just an analogy. Right? That being said, you definitely want to make sure that you do not, okay? This actually depends on the way you design your database, right? So, to make sure that you do not have confusion in your code, in most cases, people don't want to recycle key values. Okay? That, what that means is, if a student has been deleted, that implies that particular student ID value is quote unquote free. You, of course, can potentially use, reuse that student ID value for a newly inserted student, but a, a different student. Does that make sense? If you do that, te technically that's okay. But if you code ever want to do some historical kind of multi-version analysis, then you may run, end up with computers. Multi-version analysis means that you cannot try to reconstruct the instance of your database back in history. For now, we're gonna assume we have a single version database. In a single version database system, that's okay. You can recycle your key values. That's, that's no problem. But in multi version database systems, recycling key values become a really tricky issue. So you, you are asking a actually kind of deep question related with multi version and single version database system. So for now, and for the most part of this course, we're going to assume single version 
database systems. Okay? All right. So it's enough discussion on this. Now I'm going to give you some quick you know, overview of the relational query languages. So STL structured query language, we talk about it, DDL, DML. I'm going to show you a little bit of DML. We have already seen different flavor of DDL. So the syntax of SQL is actually fairly straightforward, very intuitive. You know? If you know, if if you look at this, even without taking my course, you kind of figure out what's coming up, right? So that heuristic from students at where x dot h equal to eighty, which I already talked about this what this s means, right? That's kind of like a reference variable of alias right, to simplify the reference back to your table, right? What well, the heuristic on top means, that's kind of like saying, I'm selecting all attributes. That's telling the system I'm selecting all attributes. You can also, the where is to uh, specify a Boolean expression, known as your query condition, or also known as filter, so that you know, the database system use that condition to filter what subset of records to return to you. Okay? You can also do uh, queries over multiple tables. Okay, for example, I want to. I'm oh, sorry. Before I do that, I want to talk about this example. Uh, in the in the example on top, you return all attributes. You can also, of course, select a subset of attributes. So you say select name and log in from student where age equals eighteen. Comparing these two, what that tells you is the where clause. The where clause provides filters for you to select a subset of rows. The select clause provides a list of attributes for you to select a subset of columns. So when you combine these two, you can select any row and column combination. If you think about it. Does that make sense? Okay. Now moving on to the next slide. Here is an example of a query over multiple tables. I have students on the left and you row on the right. What I'm doing is, okay, I want to find the name and the course ID for all students who were enrolling in that course and obtained a grade of A. I want to find all such combinations. The name of student and the course ID where he or she has received a grade of A. Now that's what I'm trying to do. So, as you can tell, the syntax of this query is not much different from the syntax we have seen from the earlier slide. The only difference here is that we have two tables in that from clause. Okay? And you see a little bit of the, the usage of that reference variable, the alias. Right? In this case, in order for you to link, properly link records from student enrolled, you want to make sure you are talking about the same student when you are linking up the records from the two tables. The way you ensure that is make sure student ID values are the same. That's why you have a condition that says s.sid equal to e.sid. Does that make sense? And in addition to that, you want, you want to make sure the grid from the e table is A. When that happens, you put that out, you return the name of the student and the course ID from the enroll table. Okay? Question over there? Is it not better if you define S and we a line after this? A line after we need to be more specific. So when you do it from, you define S and we a student table and we see the enroll table, right? Yes. So technically that definition is happening on the second line. Does it matter if it happens after the select? Well, you, you're already using the S that name. Oh, actually, what's we'll saying the scope of the yeah. alias, right? The scope of the alias is your entire SQL block, even though it's only defined at the from clause, but the scope of those variables is the entire block of your SQL statement. Okay. All right. So, the semantics of the query, we are seeing from this slide and the slides, uh, the, pre the previous slides, is the following, which is, this, keep in mind, this is really a conceptual way of evaluating database queries. I will explain why this is only a conceptual way of evaluating database queries. People never use this particular way to evaluate database queries, or read it, that I will explain in a minute. 
Conceptually, what's going on is you take the from clause. If there's only one relation there, you're done. If there's more than one relation there, you produce the cross product of those relations. A cross product between two relations is simply the possible pairs, all possible pairs of all records from the two relations. That's the cross product. Example, give you a simple example. If one table is A, B, C, the other table is 1, 2, then the cross product of the two is simply all possible pairs of all records from the two tables. Okay? And you can, this is, uh, is, this is the recursive definition, right? If you have three relations, what do you do? Well, you produce a cross product of the first two relations that produce a new relations. Does that make sense? Then you use the new relation combined with the third relation. Now it's a two relation case again. Then you produce yet another cross product. Notice that while you're doing the cross product, the schema of the table changed. The schema here is, for example, attribute A1, attribute A2. The schema of the resulting table is actually A1 and A2. Okay? So that's a cross product. The second step is you apply, you apply the where clause over this one by one. You check where against this, this, one by one. It's kind of like a for loop. For each record in the resulting cross product, you check the where condition. And you eliminate those that do not satisfy the where clause. OK? Then you end up with a subset of your cross product after this step, right? For example, let's say the where condition is has limited this, right? You follow me? Let's say I have also have this, then I will also eliminate this. Yes? Then I end up with a subset This is my resulting table after the where clause Then finally, come to the last step I go back to the select clause and put that out what's needed If my select is heuristic then I return both values, but if I select only A1, then I will return only B and C as my answer. Yeah, so far so good. So you can apply this conceptual way of evaluating database query to arbitrarily complex SQL queries. But database system never evaluate query using this method. Can someone <coughs> give me some hint why they never use this to evaluate query? This is really slow. Really slow. Why? Why is it really slow? Because we're computing a bunch of things which we're not going to end up needing, and we can. And some of the times we can figure out before we even. That's somewhat true, but but I can also argue in some cases. I'll give you an example of that, right? In some cases, you might have to do those unnecessary computations before you reach the final conclusion, right? For example, you use election as example. Let's say the last year election. Florida is a really close state, close up state, right? And let's say Republican candidate gets, at the end of the day, only is ahead by 1,000 votes. Does that mean, can I, knowing that result, I say, okay, let's only ask those 1,000 people to vote in the first place. Why bother ask the whole state to vote? Does that make sense? You cannot do that. You, this seemingly unnecessary vote are really necessary. So I see your argument, but it's not the root cause of what's going on here. Yeah. The cross product is slow. Because Why is the cross product slow? Can you give a rigorous argument? Because you have to step through, uh, let's say, A1 has n items and A2 has m items, and you have to step through m, n times n items. Yeah. So if, if the size of R S. If the size of R table is n, and size of S table is roughly m, then the size of the cross product is 
n times n. Or if I use n, let's say they are in the roughly the same order of magnitude in terms of size, you are looking at n squared. From n to n squared, that's a big law. Right? I don't know whether you can notice this. For example, if I only have a thousand tuples, if I only have a thousand tuples, a square of that it will be a million tuples. It's a huge blow to the efficiency of your code. You follow this? So, so that's why, and it, this is only for two tables, right? What if I have from from this, then your cost is n to the power of m. If you were to use this particular approach, n to the power of m is Forget about it. You have no way of doing it, essentially. Right? So this 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 is a, a animation or illustration of the actuary, but essentially the same as what I have shown in the ball. So I will skip that. I will move on to the next topic. So next we next we're going to talk about. Talk about first thing first, which is now knowing the basics of what relational model is, what query language looks like. We're we're kind of at least we're comfortable in this landscape now, right? Now that being said, what we're gonna do is to look at how we convert user semantics into a relational model. Meaning somebody gave you a lengthy document describing different specifications. Really lengthy one, right? Three pages, four pages, uh, one English text document describing his or her needs. How would you go about converting that to the precise relational model we just talked about? And a particular way of doing that is called uh, ER model, entity relationship model. So I'm going to skip some of the things we already know. So if if we <coughs> break up, you know, the lifetime of a database system, you start it with you you always start with requirement analysis, meaning talking to your customer, understanding his or her needs, coming out that semantic document. Just talk about. What must database do? If you ask me to build a database for you, what do I need to do? What what's what is your application need? That's what we call requirement analysis, then after you get that requirement analysis, you will then do what we call conceptual design, which is to use a precise language, a precise framework to capture what user means, to capture what user means. That's what we're doing right now. And I'm going to skip those other components because we're not in, uh, that far ahead yet. So we're going to focus on conceptual design. A particular useful tool for conceptual design is called ER model, Entity Relationship Model. In this particular framework, there are really two things you need to understand. Two things you need to understand. One is entities, one is relationship. That's it. So what are the entities and what are the relationships? And what information we need to store about those entities and relationships? And in addition to that, what kind of integrity constraint we just talked about it? We need to enforce on top of those entities and relationships. Okay? So let's talk about entity first. Entities is a plural word. Obviously, it means a set of entities, right? That's entities. So in order for us to understand entities, let's first understand entity. What is entity? An entity is a real world object distinguishable from other objects. For example, a three is an entity, it's a student entity. He is another student entity. They are both students, they are both student objects, but they are distinguishable from each other. I'm not a student entity. I was a student entity 10 years ago, but I'm no longer a student entity. Okay. 
Nobody cheer for that. I'll say that. <laughs> I was expecting like a big celebration for that. <laughs> you know, I remember when I took my last exam in my lifetime, I said, I'm done with the exam. No more exams. That motivated me to become a professor so I can give all exams to others. Speak to the table, right? So, but that's, that's if you talk about student object. If you talk about people object, then three is the people object, people entity, and another people entity. Does that make sense? So entity are distinguishable real world objects. <coughs> An entity is described using a set of attributes. Entity is described using a set of attributes. Of course, each entity may have potentially numerous number of attributes, but you only keep a subset of those properties or those attributes that you care for your application. For example, for the student object, maybe I only care about student ID, name, login, GPA, age. I don't care about his or her hobby, uh, what does he or she do over weekend. Those are also attributes of that object, but I, do, I simply do not care in the context of my application. Let me guess. Now, once you understand the concept of entity, now let's describe the concept of entity set. A collection of similar entities, for example, all employees, all students, all cats, all buildings, okay? <coughs> form an entity set, form an entity set. So, we must have some sort of requirement, right? For example, three is a student entity, so he belongs to the student entity set. I do not belong to the student entity set. However, if, we, if you're talking about people entity set, then both three and myself are in that people entity set. Okay? So all entities in an entity set must have the same set of attributes. Uh, this underpins the, the, the concept we talked about at the beginning of the semester, which is structured data. This actually tells you we are dealing with structured data, because all entities in an entity set have the same structure, described by the same set of attributes. Entity set must have a key, which is underlined, and each attribute has a domain, basically specifying the type of the attribute. <coughs> And the way you reckon in that, a picture always is worth a thousand words, right? So in ER model, instead of describing your entity and describing your entity set using words, you describe them using a picture, okay? So that is very concise and easy and intuitive to understand. The way you describe an entity is to use a rectangular box like this with the name of your entity set. put it into the box, and also a set of oval boxes attached to this rectangular box to describe those set of attributes for all entities go into this entity set. So this is the employee entity set with three attributes. What I mean is all employee entities must have three attributes. And SSN is underlined, meaning that that's a key of this entity set. Key basically means that no two entities are allowed to have the same value on that key attribute with respect to this particular entity set. Far good? All right, fantastic. Now, Having just entity set and entities is not good enough. Because real world, in real world applications, you don't have just objects. You have objects and interaction among objects. That's what you do. Right? If we only have objects, that's a dead word. You want to have interactions among objects. The way you model that interaction among objects is essentially relationship. Okay? 
So relationship is association among two or more entities. For example, this guy works in pharmacy department. This particular sentence, if you read it, it has two entities, a person entity and a department entity. It has two entities and a relationship between that two entities. Of course, relationship can have their own attribute. For example, official works in pharmacy department things January 2017. That January 2017 is an attribute that not belongs to that does not belong to the person nor the department. Its attribute belongs to that interaction, that relationship. Right? Now, if you have, that's one single relationship. That's a single relationship. Now, I can give you another example. Say, I was thinking about my name, but I paused. I don't want to work in the pharmacy department. Okay? A person ABC works in pharmacy department since February 2017. Okay? Now, that describes yet another object, person entity, interacting with possibly the same department entity, but that's a different relationship instance. That's a different relationship, right? However, it's the same type of relationships with the earlier relationship I just described, okay? So the collection of the same type of relationships, just like what we did for the entity, the collection of the same type of entities form entity set, the collection of the same type of relationships formed Relationship set. Form a relationship set. <coughs> okay? Uh, let's ignore this particular statement here for now. Uh, I will give you some more examples and then come back and explain what this means. By default, we're going to talk about binary relationships and binary relationship set. A binary relationship refers to a relationship that binds two objects, two entity objects. A binary relationship set is a collection of a bunch of binary relationships between two entity sets. So to represent that using a picture, we already know how to uh, represent an entity set, right? Employee department. So, artificial goes to the employee entity set, pharmacy department goes to the department entity set, okay? That works in becomes a relationship between the two entity sets, become a relationship set. The way we represent a relationship set is to use a diamond shape, okay? That's a relationship set, remember. That's not a single relationship. It's a relationship set. What's really going on is actually the following. I'm going to use the whiteboard to illustrate that. <coughs> so let me reproduce this example on the board here. we have. This is an entity set, this is another entity set, this is a relationship set, right? A possible instantiation of this is the following, which is <coughs> employee is a set, right? So I'm going to represent this as a set. What this means is each of this is an employee entity. 
And in this particular example, I have five employee entities. Each of these dots is nothing else but a combination of three such values. You follow me? Question? No? Okay. Similarly, I can have a department, a set of departments. In this case, let's say I have three departments. Pharmacy, I don't know, uh, some other department. Manufacturing department, sales department, pharmacy department. Each of these dots is a combination of three such values. Department ID, DNA, party. So, so those are the entities. Those are the entities. Where are the relationships? You draw a line if somebody works in a particular department, that's one relationship. Somebody else might work in that same department, and the second person might work for a different department, and that same person might be working simultaneously for two different departments. You may also have employees who don't have a department to work for yet, the new hires. So far so good? Of course, this is just one particular instance that conform to this setup. You may have millions, millions of different instances conforming to this setup. For example, if I just draw another line, having this department, having this employee working for that department, that would change to a different instance, or I just add a new employee or add a new department, or delete a department, or delete employee. Go figure, right? Many different combinations. So far is good? Okay. Entities, entity set, relationship, relationship set. Okay? Now, <clears throat> attribute for relationship set, you can of course introduce attribute for relationship set. And I think when you work for that department, you just add another oval box to the diamond shape to your relationship set. Okay, now you understand what this means? That's essentially what I just drew on the board. Yes? Um, does the relationship share attributes from the two uh, entities? No. Relationship has its own attributes. Relationship in this case has only a single attribute of things. Yeah? It works in just another table? Well, forget about the table concept. We, I, I never talk about table here, right? Okay. You are confusing. That's a mistake many of you will be making, which is confuse the concept table with ER. ER has no tables. No table whatsoever here. Forget about tables. There are no tables. We're in the conceptual design phase. We're not in the schema definition phase yet. No tables here. There are only entities, entity set, relationship, relationship set. No tables. Don't confuse. Tables, relation model with ER model. Re ER model and relation model are two completely different things. And speaking of that, the reason we talk about ER model is you can, of course, take a customer specification and try to convert that to a relation model directly. Then you can always do that. But chances are, <coughs> you will end up, end up with a really bad design. I will give you some example of that later. So, to make sure you end up with a clean, concise design, what people do is take the customer specification and convert that using ER model to an ER representation first. Then, there is a fairly mechanical way of converting an ER model to the relation model, to, as what you said, tables. And the conversion from ER, from ER model to relation model is almost fixed. Like, if this is the case, you do this. If this is the case, you do this. So once you have a good ER design, you almost have just one relation model mapping to that ER design, which is a concise and clean uh, uh, relation model. So that's the overall procedure. That's what we're doing right now. <coughs> so when you are at the ER design stage, do not, do not, do not think about tables. Never ever think about tables when you are at the ER design stage, okay? All right, so that's a simple setup. Now, entity set, 
can participate in different relationship sets or in different roles in the same set. What do I mean by those? Let me give you an example, right? For example, employee entity set has a bunch of employee entities. They participate in the work scene relationship set. But in addition to that work scene relationship set, I can also participate in another relationship set. Like, I want to introduce a hierarchical structure among my employees. Right? Some, someone has to be a manager to manage others. Right? In order for the organization to flow, right? I have to do that. So I will introduce reports to relationship set, which says one employee reports to another employee, making the second employee a manager effectively. If I draw this on the on the map here, what's really going on is that <coughs> in addition to this, I will have something like that. That this guy all report to this person, so he's a manager, he or she is a manager in this case. That makes sense? So this example illustrates both points I was trying to make. One is the same entity set may participate in more than one relationship set. Second way, second way, they may participate, they may participate in the same relationship set with different roles. For example, These employees all participate in that reports to relationship set with different roles. For example, the role of this person is manager. The role of these guys are just employees. Does that make sense? So you can participate in the same <coughs> relationship set with different roles. Um, with that example, and even the employee work in the department, is there a way to show the direction of these relations? So how can you tell uh, that, that one particular role? Person was a well, for the work scheme, there are no directions whatsoever. Well, there are no concept of direction, right? But here, yes, I see a point, which is how do I know whether this is the manager or this is the manager, right? Uh, I will talk about that in a minute. Yeah. So, because a manager is also an entity, like, how do we decide whether it's better to make something an entity or a relationship between entities? Uh, uh, good question. I'll talk about that later on, the discussion of whether something should be modeled as an entity or something should be modeled as a relationship. So to respond to your question, the way you do that is you add an annotation to uh, your design so that you know, for example, the line coming up to the left represents the supervisor, the line coming to the right is the, in, just an employee, right? So you just add an annotation to your design to distinguish the so-called direction problem. Now, key constraint. Now, the next concept is really critical, right? And it, it's, it's actually tricky to understand this, okay? If, let me erase this, of course, two. Let's focus on just work scene relationship, okay? In this example, if you think about it, it's a many-to-many -many mapping between the two. Why it is a many-to-many -many mapping between the two? An employee may work for more than one department. Okay? A department may have multiple employees working in that department as well. So it's really a many-to-many -many mapping between the two entity sets. What if I want to impose some sort of constraint? For example, I don't want my employee to work for my employee department. You follow that? That may decrease his or her productivity. An employee may work for just one department. A department, of course, may have multiple employees. Right? So what do you do? What that means is this becomes an invalid instance. You have to remove one of the line, one of the relationship. For example, I remove that. Now it's okay, right? An employee works for just at most one department. You follow that? But how do I express this using my nice, clean, nice looking pictures? How do I express that in my pictures? 
you, do you see that? How do I know what kind of constraint you are trying to enforce? And also, even an even more trickier example is, this means at most one, right? You are allowed to work for at most one department. At most one means I may work for a department or I may not work for any department. That makes sense? What if I say you have to work for at least one department and you can only work for at most one department? So at least one and at most one. What that means is this is no longer a valid instance any, anymore. You have to, these guys need to select a department to work for. They can work for that or they can work for this. But since I said nothing about whether a department must have an employee working for that department, this is okay. But let me complicate the problem even further. Let's say, okay, why having a department that nobody work for that? Not good. So I'm going to introduce another, yet another constraint that says, okay, employee works for at least one and at most one department, and all departments must have at least one employee working for that department. To satisfy that, either you add another employee working for this department, because all existing employees have been working for some other department, you cannot ask them to work for this. That will wireless the requirement of at most one. So the only way to fix this in this case is to resolve that. Nobody work for that anymore. Resolve that. Dissolve that. So far so good? But, okay, complicated stuff. How do we capture this using our design pictures? That's the point, okay? So, I, we started with many to many, but now looking at the employee part. This relationship now become a one to many man. What do I mean by one to many? If I stand from here, looking towards the department, any employee from the eye of a single employee, or any employee of your choice, I'm mapping to many, potentially many departments. So it's one employee to multiple departments. And looking at from the department side, one department may be mapped to multiple employees. So it's a one-to-many mapping of the two. No longer a many-to-many -many mapping. So far, so good? You see the difference between many-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, right? So how do you capture that in your design? Well, by default, it's just a many-to-many -many mapping. If you just draw two lines, connecting your engine set with your relation set, that by default implies, implies a many-to-many -many mapping. Okay, let me keep the work seeing relationship set as a managed many mapping. Meaning that, okay, it's fine, you work for multiple departments. That's okay. I allow you to, to do that. Oops. We use the same color for the same relationship. Okay, you can work for multiple departments. That's okay. Manage many. But now I want to introduce another relationship set between the two. Say, I want to specify some employees a small subset of employees to be the managers of the corresponding departments. So that requires us to introduce yet another relationship set between the two. And the requirement is when you say you have a manager, obviously each department should have only one manager. Right? Better be, right? If we have two presidents, one Democrat, one Republican, nothing gonna happen, right? No? I signed the executive order today, 10 minutes later, the other guy will void the executive order. Nothing got get done. So each department should have just one manager, right? But I can be a manager of multiple departments. <coughs> one person can manage multiple departments, that's okay. So it's a one-to-many mapping. Do you see that? One person can be manager of multiple departments, but each department can be mapped to only a single person 
to be the manager of that department. So it's a one-to-many from where to where, from employee to department. So it's a one-to-many from employee to department because of that. So what that means is you will have another, yet another relationship. This is one relationship set. You will have another relationship set like that. This person is a manager of both departments. Because of that, because it's a one-to-many mapping, every department should have only one manager. There should be no more green lines coming out of these two departments anymore. Because of that. You follow me? These are two different relationship sets over the same two entity sets. And the way you capture that, one to many, is to simply use an arrow. When you draw an arrow coming off from the many side, this is really important, right? Because one to many is different from many to one. If I draw the arrow like this, this means department is on the many side and the employee is on the one side. So one employee can be the manager of multiple departments, but each department can only have one manager. Let me test you guys, if I change Still a lot of things to do for computer science. I, I, I imagine one day AI is announced now and say, flip the arrow, <coughs> done. <laughs> How easy is that? <laughs> okay, we're getting somewhere. I just need to flip the direction of this. Okay, come here. You come here. All right. Put this back on. Okay. Now, can someone tell me what this means now? Same thing, I just flip the arrows. You mean that one employee has to manage all of it? No, that's not true. It's a, now it's a manage one map between employee and the department, right? Go ahead. Would it be that each, each, employee, employee, each employee can only manage one department, but departments have multiple managers? Excellent. Excellent. Each employee can manage only one department, if he or she is a manager. Not every employee needs to be a manager, by the way. You follow me? But if you are a manager, you can only be a manager for one department, but a department may have multiple managers. If I just flip the arrow, the semantics completely change. Very good. OK? Yeah, question over there? Yes, uh, I, I didn't change the, if I flip the arrow, then the one should be here, the many should be there, okay? I, you know, if I flip the arrows, okay? Okay, but of course, this no longer reflects the, what I said here. This map to the earlier version of this part, okay? Now, question on this? So far, so good. What if I do this? <coughs> now what happens? Am I want to help me out? Arrow is on both hands. Say again? Invalid. Invalid. No, it's still valid. It's still valid. Go ahead. One to one. One to one, excellent. But translate that to English. Uh, 
Uh, so every employee can be at, at most like a manager at one department, and every department has one manager. Yes. If an employee is a manager, you can be a manager at, at most one department. And if a department has a manager, you can have at most one manager. Okay? One to one. By the way, notice that I've, I've been very careful in saying if an employee is a manager, then he or she can be manager of at most one department. What I implied is not every employee needs to be a manager. And similarly, if a department has a manager, it has at most one manager. It doesn't imply that every department needs to have a manager. It's perfectly okay to have a graph like this to satisfy that design, which is, okay, this employee, the manager, is a manager of at most one department, and this department has just one manager. But this department has no manager whatsoever, and this guy are not employee. That's totally fine. Question? How from this image do you know that it's one to one? Because I have two hours. Okay. Do you, do you guys follow what I'm saying? Right. So, key constraints, this brings up another concept, which is key constraints only specify the possible mappings. Is it one to many, many to one, or one to one? But it says nothing about the participation of entities in the corresponding relationships. For example, I, that word thing is a manage many. So this is fun, all employee, but I, in addition, I want to capture the semantic that all employee need to work for some department. You see that? How do I capture that? Well, so manage many, one to many, one to one, okay? Now, how do I capture that? I use a bold line to indicate that. When you have a bow line like this, this is no longer okay. This is no longer okay. You have to work for an environment. Okay? Yes? Now, if I, using that idea, what happens if I do this? Can someone explain to me what this means? Anyway, let me go through the animation first. So this means all employees must work for some department. If I add both to this end, this means all departments must have some employee working for that. And it's many to many. What if I do this? Can someone explain to me what this means? Yes. And how many managers that department can have? Yes. It's a one to many mapping. So Without the boat, they already imply each department can have at most one manager. Now with the boat, that means you have to have at least one manager. Combine the two means that each department has exactly one manager. Okay? What if I add both to the employee and as well? What does that mean? If I vote this line? All employee manager. That's the corporation you want to work for? <laughs> You know, if I, if, I, if I were you, I would be smart. That's the corporation you don't want to work for, because that corporation will go bankrupt soon, soon or later, the next day. I know everybody wants to be mad here, I know everybody wants to be present, but reality is somebody has to do the work. Okay? If everybody becomes mad here, that corporation goes down hill for sure. Yeah, go ahead, question. Would that also mean that there would be equal numbers of departments and employees? If no. You that one? No. Department, what this means, oh, you mean if I have this one. If, if you pulled that line, um, that means all the closure. No, that's true, because it's still one to many, so I can have one. You could have managers. If it's one to one, I have both those lines, what you, what you said. Oh. But it's not one to one in this case, right? You could have managers with no departments. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, now I'm ready to present the, uh, the binary ternary stuff, right? So far we talk about binary relationships. Set. We can obviously have ternary relationships, set, meaning that uh, a relationship that's connecting more than two entity sets. So here is a relationship connecting three entities. Three entity sets. So for example, employee purchase, we all have healthcare stuff, right? 
it's, it was a big deal, right? right? The Obamacare, then the Department tried to get rid of it, all, all that stuff, right? So healthcare is a big deal. So let's say I want to capture that. So employee may purchase policies, healthcare, healthcare policies. An employee may have dependents. And when they purchase policy, they choose to not only cover themselves, but cover their dependents too. Do you follow the sequence so far? So that becomes a ternary relationship set, right? Because not only employee and policies are involved, dependents are involved as well. Okay? Then you may come up with a design like this. You say, okay, employee purchase policies, and I have many different policies I need to choose from. For example, one policy for my life insurance, one policy for my medical care, typical day-to-day -day medical care, another policy for my dental care. You follow that? And different employees may purchase the same policy. For example, under dental, I may have 10 different dental plans. Some employees may purchase the same plan, some employees may choose to purchase different plans. So, with that discussion, employee and policy is a managed management. And there are no total participation constraints either because, well, under Obamacare, there was a total participation constraint. That's what it is. If there are database people, that 100 pages legislation can be reduced to a both line. Right? Everybody must have a uni universal health care is a both line, total population. That's what it is. But let's say employee doesn't have to purchase policy, then there are no total population constraint here. Similarly, a policy is designed, but employee, none, none of your employee choose to purchase that. That's okay as well. So that's what we add up here. Many to many mapping between the two, no total participation constraint between employee and policy. So far so good, everybody understand that. What about employee and dependence? Well, this has to be a one to many mapping, right? Why? In, the, in all the possible scenarios I can think of, a dependence depends on one person, right? An employee, an employee may have multiple dependents, right? I have, for example, my, I have two, if I have two kids, then I have two dependents. But they all depend on just one person. Does that make sense? So it's a one to many matching between employee and dependents. Okay, like the wife who works as well. well, in those cases, typically, if you work for a corporation, typically they will ask you, dependent, to choose one of you as the primary. You cannot declare dependence twice. Just like when you file your tax, same thing. All right, so that's kind of the setup so far. Now, if, so far so good, but if each policy is owned by just one employee, meaning that, this corporation is very special, saying that, okay, I want to customize the healthcare policy for each and every individual employee of mine. Does that make sense? So each person has his or her unique policy. And that policy cannot be used by another employee. Do you follow that discussion? How do you change the diagram here? How would you do it? Somebody tell me that? Oh. An arrow from policies to cover. An arrow to, from policy to uh, uh, covers. Fantastic. Because it says an employee may still purchase multiple policies, but a policy now belongs to just one employee. So now from a many to many, it becomes a one to many. Okay? However, uh, we're running out of time, so let me finish what I want to say, then we can, I can answer your question offline. But this introduced an uh, undesirable subsequent uh, consequence, which is, now, it used to be po between policy and dependent is also one to many, which makes sense. You, you purchase one policy, that policy can be used to cover all your dependents, one to many. But now, because of this, you, you accidentally introduce an undesirable one-to-one -one mapping between policy and dependence. What does it mean? That means each policy can be used to cover just one dependent. 
and each dependent can be covered by just one policy, which is not the intention. You only said a policy is owned by one employee and said nothing about a oh, policy can cover just one dependent. But as a side effect, negative side effect, you introduce that ambiguity in your data. You follow the argument? And there's no easy way to address that using a ternary relationship study now. So the only way to address that is to break this ternary relationship set. So far, this is good, but introducing this is no longer good. So what I will do is I will break up this ternary relationship set into two binary relationship set. So that employee purchase policies, one to many between the two, and I also require total participation constraint here because each policy is uniquely designed for one employee, so only keep around those policies that employees are actually interested in. If you have a policy nobody cares, I don't care. You know, stay in my data. And the policy now can in turn cover multiple dependents, one many. So using two binary relationships, I can achieve what I want to do. That where the ternary relationship is not able to do. So this example tells you in some scenarios, in some scenarios, a ternary relationship set will, will not satisfy what you want to do. So you have to use two binary relationship set. Now, I want to give you another, I'm running out of time, so uh, I will give you this example next time, but I can give you a preview of what this example tells you. The table can be flipped. There are also possible scenarios where you have to use a ternary relationship set. Using two or multiple binary relationship sets will not be able to accomplish, accomplish what that ter one single ternary relationship set is able to do for you. I will talk about that uh, on Monday. Okay. I will, uh, before I let you go, I will release homework one today, but you probably will not be able to work all the problems in homework one yet, but some of them you can start solving that. Yeah, so what happens is if you want me to show you real quick? Yeah, yeah. I'll show you real quick. I actually have a class after this. Do you guys care? No, I mean, do you guys care? Do you guys care? I'll show you guys. So, I'll show you guys. Here, here, I'm going to stop.